The following is a recording of the keynote speech by Mr. Stan Drakemiller at the 37th annual meeting of the USC Marshall Center for Investment Studies on May 1st, 2023. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I um, I came here two years ago and um, gave a talk, uh, but many people may not know that I was also here a little over 10 years ago. Um, at the time, uh, I had looked at the demographics and I had looked at what was going on with entitlements and I got quite exercised by the fact that um, the baby boomers would be turning uh, 65 in full force in about 10 years and I became terrified of the prospects of some kind of financial crisis in the 2025 to 2035 period. But it wasn't something you could wait on. So USC was part of a college tour. And I specifically wanted to energize young people because it was young people that were suffering, in my opinion, the brunt of what I considered great um, generational inequity. I was, I was naive enough to think I could move the needle. Um, I was clearly wrong. The only thing Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton agreed on in 2016 is we shouldn't touch entitlements. I'm probably naive to this day to think I can move the needle again, but honestly, um, I've looked at what's gone on over the last 10 years and the situation looks so dire I just got to give it another shot. <laughs> and um, what better place to start at USC? It was funny because <laughs> I went to all these colleges, and I understand why I was well received at USC and Notre Dame and, and University of North Carolina, but I also went to Bowdoin, Brown, and Berkeley and thought I'd be booed out of the room. And the, th the students were actually quite enthusiastic afterward, but I don't know, maybe they went back to their rooms and smoked pot or something because <laughs> I, I certainly didn't start a, start a movement. So for the younger in the audience, um, some of you might think, I'm just starting my career. Why should I care about this generational issue? Let me tell you, you, you may not be thinking about your retirement or your health care bill when you grow old, but if nothing changes, pensions tomorrow will be a fraction of what they are today and the government won't be able to pay half of your health care bill. Think about it. In 20 or 30 years, there will be fewer young workers, many more seniors that need our support, and we'll be starting with the highest national debt in history. If you believe you will have as comfortable a retirement as current seniors, like me and Sheldon, unfortunately, think again. And long before you retire, the horrible consequences of, the, of remaining on the path we have foolishly stuck with will be borne by you and your children. The arithmetic just doesn't work out. Let me give you some facts. The share of fiscal spending going to seniors has been growing dramatically since the 60s when Medicare and Medicaid joined Social Security as federal entitlements. Today we spend 6x 6x more per senior than we do for child in this country. Think Social Security versus education. Almost 40% of all our taxes are spent on seniors, and the trend is just only getting started. So here's the demographic problem I was worried about. I'm not too good with pointers. Um, this is when I came here, and this is where we are now. What I was worried about is after World War II and everybody came back, um, everybody had a bunch of babies. Uh, and the birth rate peaked in 1957 at 3.7. It's currently under two. So you had this moving bulge of Sheldon and I and a zillion others, and we're the boomers. Um, the problem is the boomers are all turning 65 right when that line hits. And we, can, we continue to grow, and we're living longer, but the current generation isn't making babies at, at that rate anymore. So what you have is a huge 
growth in surplus of older Americans who are receiving entitlements, but you don't have the younger workers creating enough revenue to pay for them. Um, so if you look at this, we're just getting underway in terms of the consequences of this great boom. In 25 years, the spending on seniors, it's up there on the chart, will grow to 70% of all taxes. It'll be 60% in 20 years. It's 40% today. Effectively, these entitlements, they're going to be compounding away and they're going to squeeze everything else out in terms of private and public investment. In this context, the fiscal recklessness of the last decade, for me, given what my thoughts were, has been like, like watching a horror movie unfold. Look at this chart. Uh, you're looking at the level of indebtedness only comparable of the US over the last 100 years. And you'll see the big bulge when we had to wave, pay for World War II. And then you'll see the big bulge now. Since I came to USC and talked about this, the federal debt, which I was concerned about at the time, has grown from 15 trillion to 31 trillion. But what is worse, and this is what really annoys me, and I, well, I no one talks about it. Right before I came over here, some Republican was on TV ranting about the debt because it's 32 trillion. Do you know that the 32 trillion assumes the federal government will never make another Social Security or Medicare payment. Only government accounting could think <laughs> that the government is never going to make another payment. Not one. Not to me. Not to Sheldon. Not to you guys when you get older. That's what the accounting reads. If you actually accounted for that, um, the debt wouldn't be $31 trillion. Credible estimates, if you present value that, $200 trillion. That's 200 trillion with a T. Um, what makes the last 10 years particularly horrific is that we've had golden opportunities to reduce this fiscal gap ahead of the de demographic storm that I showed in the first part. You know, the, the, the debt load we have now, by the way, is not even comparable to the first debt load anyway, because they didn't have this demographic problem back then. So that was kind of a true debt load there. And you see how it came down dramatically right after World War II? That's because they cut government spending, um, and they also raised taxes to unwind for the paying of the war. So fast forward to present day. We're back up here again. In the last 10 years, we've had the opportunity to do the same. But look what we've done. Um, in the recovery in after the great financial crisis, uh, when, when President Trump came in, a Republican administration who claimed they were for spending restraint, but only, by the way, when they're out of power, the deficit never went lower than 5% of GDP. It's unheard of in a full-blown recovery of that kind of force to have a deficit. You're historically, you would run a surplus. And then post-COVID, we had a booming economy where tax revenues were augmented by high inflation, nominal growth of over 10 percent, a windfall of capital gains taxes, 600 billion above average because of the tech boom. We made 100 billion in spe spectrum sales. So you had a booming economy, you had 10 percent nominal growth, you had inflation. So you might reasonably ask, how much bigger was the surplus that year? than in the tech boom in the late 90s when we actually went into surplus. Well, incredibly, as the search shows, we ran a deficit, and it was over a trillion dollars. Never in history has a booming economy produced a worse fiscal result. Never. Expect this trend, and it is a trend, as you can see, to continue, absent radical policy changes. The arithmetic of your entitlements just doesn't work. So imagine asking yourself how much taxes you need to be raised today to maintain the current level of safety net into the future going forward. That amount economists call the fiscal gap. That's how much you would have to raise taxes today to keep these payments that we've promised the same in the future as they are now. 
Today, that measure is 7.7% of GDP. When I presented here 10 years ago, it was 7.2% of GDP. Okay, what does 7.7% 7 .7 fiscal gap, gap of GDP means? Here's what it means. To fix it, you would need a 40% increase, permanent tax increase, today, forever, or you'd have the other lovely choice of a 35% cut in, fit in spending today, forever, permanent. Two dreadful choices, and frankly, they're probably still underestimated. I think USC Business School students would understand if you raise taxes or you cut spending that much, uh, investment would inevitably falter and growth would suffer considerably, making it impossible to maintain the size of our current safety net. Now, how ironic that France, it's the second bar chart, France, the poster child for social welfare state, their fiscal gap is less than a third of ours, and they've just been through huge political evil because he wants to do the right thing for the next generation. Meanwhile, in the US, the only thing the Democrats and the Republicans can agree on is that entitlement shouldn't be touched. And waiting only makes the problem worse as interest rates keep building. That's the problem here. The longer you rate, Wait, in, in addition to the entitlements, the interest rates start compounding like crazy. So here's the chart. How big would this be? Well, if interest rates were 5%, interest rates every year would be as big as the entire COVID relief of 2020. The entire thing, but every year, forever. As the chart shows, now this is using CBO estimates. These are not mine. I didn't make them up. Um, this is using 4% interest rates. The interest rate bill goes from 8% of outlays now to 27% in 2050. This is a nightmare for future economic growth, investment, and productivity, and of course you, the future taxpayer. Let me put some numbers to that. If you add up currently the health care spend plus Social Security plus interest, it's 68% of tax revenues. By 2040, on the CBO chart, not mine, it'll be 100% of all taxes, just spending for seniors and just the interest. By 2052, it'll be 117%. Taxes will be 117%. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the, the spending for seniors and, and interest alone will be 117% of revenues. So. Nothing left for defense, nothing for NIH, nothing for DARPA, none of that stuff. So here's the punchline. It's time that we let go of the false pretense that cutting entitlements is a choice. It's not a choice. Either we cut them today, or we'll have to cut them much more tomorrow. As if the irresponsible behavior wasn't enough, around 15 years ago, the Fed simultaneously did start decided to start courting asset bubbles. For those who knew, who've read me, you knew I wasn't going to let the Fed get away without me firing at them before this speech was over. Around the time I was here, this is two years, I'm sorry, 10 years ago, Ben Bernanke embarked on QE2, another round of rapid expansion of the Fed's balance sheet. The chairman feared a period like the 1930s and wanted to buy insurance to avoid deflation by not only keeping policy rates at zero, but also by reducing long-term interest rates. He assured everyone this would be a temporary measure. I quote, monetization would require a permanent increase in the money supply to pay the government's bills through money creation. What, we've, what we're doing here is temporary measure that will be reversed so that at the end of this process, the money supply will be normalized the Fed's balance sheet will be normalized, and there will be no permanent increase, either in money outstanding or in the Fed's balance sheet. Whoops. <laughs> Since then, and despite these confident words, and several periods of strong growth with high inflation, which I've already shown you, 
the Fed never felt the need to meaningfully reduce its balance sheet. The balance sheet of the Fed today stands at just below $9 trillion, or 10 times as large as before the financial crisis. I repeat, 10 times. This is what he said he was going to do, normalize. This Fed has enabled risk behavior from investors, banks, and the government. It has driven unprecedented asset bubbles in both breadth and magnitude. This is a chart I don't need to explain. The tech frenzy, the crypto craze, SPACs, the search for yield by investors, and yes, also by regional banks, while it has truly been an everything bu bubble, nothing symbolized it more than Dogecoin, <laughs> which started as a joke, literally as a joke, and reached a market cap of, anybody know? 80 billion, 80 billion for a joke uh, crypto coin. As I have repeatedly said, central banks should be in the business of balancing rather than fueling asset prices or risky behavior. Some of the costs of the Fed's loose policies are now apparent to, to all. Inflation has become part of our dinner conversations. So have bank runs. Unfortunately, by still owning a large amount of government debt, the Fed continues to create the false illusion that it can help our fiscal problems. Take the spring of 21. It was obvious then that we were not only avoiding a deep hole, but the economy was already booming and we were developing an inflation problem. It was so obvious that even I predicted it right here two years ago. Bizarrely, the Fed kept their foot on the gas and Congress kept spending after it was clear the recovery was well in place and booming. Congress spent another $3 trillion, bringing their COVID total to $5 trillion, with the Fed financing over 60% of all issuance. Powell's Fed acted as a great enabler for fiscal excesses. Had it not been for one senator, Joe Manchin, they would have spent another $3 trillion. Trying to correct the biggest mistake in Fed history, in the last year they have now raised rates 500 basis points in one year. Better late than never, well, I guess. Still, at the first kinds of trouble a month ago, Silicon Valley Bank, what do they do? In four days, they undid all the QT progress they had made in six months. Uh, <laughs> this asymmetric Fed response is what feeds the lack of serious structure, structural action in D.C. from both sides of the aisle. It allows the Biden administration and Congress to avoid having to address our long-term dilemma that I've presented. It helps the Republican House talk a tight budget while leaving entitlements off the table, when we all know there's not enough money unless you go after entitlements. It allows the Biden administration to astonishingly suggest the need to increase the rate of spending and label Republicans' already timid proposals as wacko. Who's the wacko, Mr. President? It is hard to under overstate the myopic absurdity of the current policy and the predicament we find ourselves in. To conclude, I greatly admire your generation's focus on the long-term implications and the ability to think ahead about climate change and your willingness to take action. I urge you to take action against the bipartisan myopic abuse of our seed corn at the expense of future investment and growth. American exceptionalism and innovation have been on its display in my entire career. We led the PC revolution. We led the development of the internet. We led the move to mobile. We led the move to cloud. We led the move to, in blockchain. And now we're leading in generative AI. Indeed, the cover story of The Economist two weeks ago, Riding High, documented the astonishing success of American capitalism in the last 30 years. Further delay in addressing the fiscal gap threatens the future of us not riding high, but rather sinking into malaise, decay, and the end of the American dream. It will embolden autocracies in places like China and Russia, and tragically, risks a lack of wealth to make sufficient investments 
to address existential crises like climate change and a lack of growth to afford programs for the least well off among us. Thank you. Yeah, I'll moderate it a little bit. Everybody in a good mood now? <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Stan. Um, so how much time do we have, Professor Kuh? OK, so we have about a little less than 45 minutes. I'll kick us off a little bit, and then I'll make sure that the graduating class has time to ask questions, the board has time to ask questions, and that everybody has some time to ask questions. So I guess the easiest question to start with would be, can you connect this challenging of US exceptionalism to your current investment portfolio and, and how you're thinking about things? Um, not with the frequency I trade, but it's, it's in the background and it's something I'm thinking about. Um, in terms of, as opposed to trades, but investments, yeah, it, ha it has huge implications. Um, I'm short the dollar. There's a number of reasons I'm short the dollar, but this certainly doesn't feel me, make me feel particularly good about it when France is acting more responsible on an existential pro a problem for our country than we are. Um, but yeah, the, the whole thing, the whole thing bothers me. <laughs> Does it bother you to the extent where you would say uh, less clear about the dollar as the reserve currency of the world going forward? Yeah, it, it's one of a number of things. But look, the, the, the dollar thesis, and this is not like some big leverage play I've made in the past. So please don't go out and short the dollar tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, the dollar thesis is pretty simple. We had $13 trillion come in here the last I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Currency movements tend to take place in big waves and big long waves. It came in here partly because our tech companies were dominating. Uh, a lot of foreign investors invested in sovereign wealth funds, invested in FANG. Then we tightened monetary policy earlier and more dramatically than I'd say our G7 competitors did. And it looks to me like we're, we're coming to the end of that process and they still have further to go. But yeah, I, I mean, all this argument over the, over the debt ceiling to me is like, I don't know, you're sitting out on the pier in Santa Monica and you see a 30-foot wave and you're worried about what the 30-foot wave's going to do to the pier and there's like a 200-foot tsunami 10 miles out, but all we're talking about is the 30-foot wave. And... I think also, why did we even get reserve currency status? Not just rule of law. We had better fiscal behavior, as, as you saw there, for 30 or 40 years. Volcker was miracle man in terms of lower inflation rate. I mean, believe it or not, we have a higher inflation rate now than Brazil. So when Lula goes over and he says to Xi Jinping, I don't understand why we have to do these transactions in dollars. Why can't we do renemi? That would not have been a reasonable question 30 years ago. Given our behavior, I think it's now become a reasonable question. You know this thing about the curse, curse of uh, resources under the ground? We're almost getting hung by on petard here. We're, since we are the reserve currency, we're, a way to, we're getting away with stuff that the market would have checked on. Look what happened when Liz Truss tried to do a spending program in, in, mm -hmm. in Britain that was nothing like ours. You know, you had a collapse in the pound. She got thrown out of office. So it, it, it fits in some, Ruben. It's, it's part of a broader thesis. But yeah, it's, it will continually sort of infiltrate yeah. my investment strategy going forward. It's such a big picture macro play. I guess I want to talk a little bit about um, your strategy through time. And looking in today's world, do you feel like it's a harder market to be a successful macro investor compared to previous periods in your career? Um, well, currently, yes, because I like to try and come up with economic forecasts for the future. And I've been 
had my misses, but I've been a lot better than random at it. Uh, and, and my process is trying to look at a lot of history and trying to equate it with what's going on now. And I've never seen a roadmap like this. I mean, we were buying 120 billion bonds a month all the way until inflation went to 7.7%. We've had an 11-year asset bubble. Now the Fed's jacked rates up 500 points. I have some intuition, but I don't really have any roadmap. Um, having said that, um, you know, I'm sorry, this is on tape. I make, I, make, <laughs> I make my money in chaos. I've always made more money in equity bear markets than I have in bull markets because that's when macro goes crazy. If I wasn't so worried about the country, I'd be salivating hmm. over the opportunities that's going to set up. I've been talking about 2025 to 2035 for better than 15 years, and last time I checked, this is 2023. So we're getting into the time period. I didn't mention that CBO estimate for 2050 with a 4% interest rate. It had an 11% deficit. I mean, I'll tell you right now, if we have an 11% deficit, uh, we're not going to be the reserve currency. We're not. Um, but you can already see things chipping away. First of all, most of the people that own our assets abroad, other than Japan, they hate us. Uh, China's got a zillion treasuries, Saudi Arabia, you know, Biden called the guy the pariah. Um, so I don't see them storing their wealth in dollars. And a lot of my investment process is intuitive, but I could just kind of feel it chipping away into some kind of multipolar world as opposed to just us dominating. Could be wrong. Hope I'm wrong. It'd be a hell of a thing to lose. <laughs> the, uh, if I go back to kind of the student presentations, some of the takeaways that they had were about position sizing. Um, you're kind of famous for your, for your thoughts on uh, swinging at kind of fat pitches and when you see something you like, putting meaningful amounts of money behind it. Is it fair to say that in an environment like this that you would describe as more challenging, that you slow down a little bit or take, take some speed off that? Or how do you think about how you place your bets in, in today's world? Well, luckily, I don't have any clients, so I don't have performance FOMA. Mm -hmm. um, and you've described it very well. I, I wait for fat pitches, and then I play really big. And if I'm wrong, constantly reevaluate it. One of the great things about playing big, you don't get lazy <laughs> about believing your own you know what. Uh, so right now, that's why the dollar, you know, it's a thesis I have, but it's not a fat pitch. I've seen a lot of fat pitches in my career. This thing is so complicated. I just want to stay alive, you know, financially until the chaos comes because it's coming, uh, given our behavior. Let me ask one more thing and then I'll, I'll open up a little bit. But for the sake of the room, maybe those that don't know your story as well, what's the fattest pitch that you swung at that worked out well? Can I name two? Go for it. Okay. So. The first was when the wall came down in Germany. Um, I knew the history of Germany, and I knew the history of German culture. And frankly, the, the hyperinflation of the Weimar Republic is the reason Hitler was able to come to power. And so ever since World War II, the Germans have not only been embarrassed, but they've been obsessed with inflation, and they had the strongest central bank in the world. So when the wall came down in Germany, I'll never forget, you like to remember your wins. You kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> I've had plenty of losses. You try and wipe that out of your mind. But um, the Deutschmark got killed for two days because the theory was the Ostmark, which was the East German currency, was going to pollute the Deutschmark. But I kind of knew German culture. These people really like, they got a great work ethic. They were rejoining us, and I thought the economy was going to boom. And I knew exactly what the Bundesbank would do. They would just keep raising rates to make sure they didn't get inflation. And that's what happened. And out of that, I had a big win shorting the Italian lira, which broke, the Swedish kroner, which broke, and obviously the British pound. 
which was the easiest of all because in Britain, they desperately needed lower rates because they were an Anglo-Saxon housing-driven economy and they were going down while the Germans were going up. So that, that thing just couldn't hold over time. The, the second one was um, I bought the exact, well, it's a long story, but um, I bought the tech boom pretty well after having missed it in mid-99, made a fortune in tech stocks, sold them all out like 10 days into the year, and then watched everybody else making money, and then did something I don't want any young person in this room ever to do. I like acted totally emotionally. I couldn't stand it that the market was going up. And all these guys were making 3% a day. I, I think I missed the top by about a half an hour at Soros. So <laughs> I plow in, I lose like $3 billion, in four months. I'm absolutely devastated. Uh, I can't sleep. I've already told him I'm quitting. I send the Duquesne investors a letter and I say, look, I'm, I'm going on a sabbatical. I don't know where to come back. If you want, take all your money out. But if you take it out, I might not let you back in. That was good because I had 200, <laughs> 200 investors in 199 stayed. Um, I came back. In September, I didn't read a newspaper. I made sure I didn't follow the market. And the NASDAQ had rallied back almost to the high, and the S&P had rallied back to the high. But the dollar had rallied, which is generally negative for equities. Um, oil had rallied, which was negative for equities. So I called up my friend Ed Hyman, and I said, what is going on? Why is the market rallying? And um, I said, oil's up. Interest rates are up, the dollar's up. I called around to my clients. I had a lot of small businessmen as clients. I didn't have many big institutional investors. All of them said their business is going like this. Greenspan had a tightening directive on. So I was convinced with the anecdotal information with this that the economy is going to tank. And I put 350% of my fund in 10-year equivalents. Uh, I was down 18% at the time. I thought I was going to have my first down year, and I made 42% in the fourth quarter. It was the biggest layup. I, I mean, I, I couldn't believe. Fed funds were six and a half, and two years were 604, not that I would remember. Um, <laughs> but I thought they might go to two. They went to one. So those, mm. those, those are fat pitches. We don't have anything like that today. Well, maybe we do, but I'm not seeing it. Awesome. I'll, uh, I'll open up again. I think the, a little preference to the board and then any members of the graduating class. Stan, what ever happened to modern monetary theory? This was a hot thing a year or two years ago. Is anyone, has anyone advanced that further or has that been debunked? I think when the money supply grew 42% year over year in uh, 21 and inflation did go to 9%, that was the end of that theory, that you could print all the money and keep rates at zero and not have any consequences. It's funny because the inflation thing has gotten the notice it should have. I don't think the asset bubble has. What scares me, there's a book, if you guys have time to read, I highly recommend called The Price of Time by Edward Chancellor. It documents all the asset bubbles the last 500 years. And invariably, they're followed by the worst economic outcomes because asset bubbles create stupid behavior. People like me buying at the top in the 99 or 2000 bubble, um, people lose their senses when you force them out the risk curve. And this one's been 11 years, and it's been broad, as you can see up there. Um, I'm just really worried that there's more bodies out there. I don't know what the bodies are. I knew what the bodies were in 07. Uh, I didn't know it was going to be Silicon Valley, but I, I don't think we've seen the last of it. When you give free money for a long period of time, people do stupid things. One of the crazy things in that book is he keeps referencing the 1300s and 1500s when every time interest rates go below 2%, things go wild. Yeah, and they didn't just go to 2%. They, I think 40% of the money in the world was negative rates. Um, 
and we were buying bonds, so effectively our rates were even more negative. I'm impressed that you read the book, Ruben. It's good book. I like fixed income. It's a tour de force. Please. <coughs> Hi, thank you for taking. Uh, I've got three quick questions. Number one, have you had a chance to read Ray Dalio's missive about war with China, especially over Taiwan? Your thoughts on that? Number two, California, um, if you could concentrate, are we leading, are we way behind, obviously, in terms of entitlement? And then entitlements, and if California is a good place to live in the future. And then number three, who are the parties going to be in the presidential election, and who is going to win? <laughs> um, I'm not a big Ray Dalio disciple. I'll give you my view on China and with respect to Taiwan. Um, the mitigating factor is mutual self-destruction in the sense that I think uh, Xi knows that if he takes Taiwan, we can take out every semiconductor fab that TSM does in 30 minutes, and we will. He knows that. There's a great national sentiment um, in China to take Taiwan. I remember I spoke at Chinhua 30 years ago, and I said, who thinks you should take Taiwan? And every student raised their hand, like, instantly. But I just don't see it happening in the next three to five years. I'm long NVIDIA. I'm terrified it is going to happen. If it does, I'm going to lose a lot of money that day. Well, I might make it somewhere else. Um, California. But, but the problem is I don't, I'm a little worried about the Chinese economy going forward just because the reason a lot of the recovery was became semi-capitalist and Xi has proved himself to be a, to be a uh, Maoist and there's only room for one monopoly in China and that's him. So. The more economic trouble you get in, it's more likely that he takes Taiwan because that's when dictators do their thing when they're having economic problems. Third question was who's going to be who's going to run California for president? California and then president. Oh, California's screwed. I mean, <laughs> Cal I mean, it's it's just amazing. It's the most beautiful state. W with you know, you got snow and mountains. You get this beautiful coast, and I remember. When I first got in the business, just follow California, because everything they did, this was back in the Reagan years, that would become a trend. Uh, Governor Hairdo, he's just, I, I mean, I just, I can't believe what's going on here. Um, and it's so sad. I have a home here. I love, I don't live here, but um, I think California's kind of the eye of the storm. I don't know why they keep reelecting re the people they do, but. Hopefully it'll get bad enough, but not so bad that the electorate will move the other way before it becomes existential. The third question was? Presidential election, who's going to be there, who's going to win? I don't know. I'm so emotional on this. I, I just, I will, I mean, we got 340 million people in this country, and we're going to have Biden versus uh, Trump on the menu? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. I meet 50 people a day, 10 times as confident as either one of them. Um, I'm, it looks like the d no Democrat is going to challenge Biden, which I don't understand. I guess he wouldn't debate them, so maybe he wouldn't reveal um, his issues. Um, Trump has, I, I can't, I. <laughs> it's being recorded. I, don't forget. <laughs> it's okay. He knows what I said about him. Um, I don't know how to handicap that one. He's got a hardcore 25 to 30 percent of the Republican voters, and enough people run out against him. Maybe the math works that way. Maybe he did something really criminal in Mar-a-Lago that we don't know about. The thing in New York, I'm, I'm such a cynic, I think they probably did that because they're Democrats, to raise his ratings with the Republican, because that is the dumbest suit I've ever seen. It, it, it has no, it, it just doesn't have any merit to it. But I don't know. I, I think if it's Biden versus Trump, Joe Manchin will run. And 
I don't think he'll win, but I'm not smart enough to know which one of those two he's going to take. I'm just <laughs> hoping it's neither Biden nor Trump. But that's not an answer, but it's the best I got. Thank you. So? I'm wondering how you're thinking through the whole financial thing with Signature, Fidel, uh, First, First Republic, Silicon. I've never seen asset issues pop up the way that they have so quickly. I, even in the 07, 08, you could kind of see AIG coming. You could kind of see Lehman, Bear Stearns. I don't know what's coming next. And it feels like if, if something isn't done, we're going to end up with five or ten mega financial institutions. There's got to be some ramification of that in the markets. But I, I bet you knew something was coming, but you didn't know what was coming. Right. What we do know, and this is why the situation is potentially very toxic, is that there are hundreds of banks, and supposedly Bank America, that if you mark their assets to market, they have no capital. And we haven't even gotten into the loan losses. <laughs> you and I have seen a lot of uh, bank runs and that kind of stuff in our time. But it's always loans, credit. It's never your balance sheet. By the way, what's the irony of that? The reason they had all this stuff is Dodd-Frank changed the risk-weighted assets so treasuries didn't count against your capital. But I, I worry the median. Um, bank in the United States has 43% of their loans in real estate. And with COVID, particularly on the coast, nobody goes to the office anymore. So you got this toxic situation there. I don't know what the answer again, but again, to the fat pitch scenario, I know the market acts great. I know everybody like me hates it, which means it usually goes up when everybody hates it. But I don't need to play. I mean, there's got to be more dead bodies out there that haven't revealed themselves. And you notice how all these political leaders, and I guess it's their job in the Treasury Secretary, Jamie Dimon today, this is nothing like 08, 09. Excuse me, I don't remember any of you predicting uh, 08, 09 until after the fact. And modestly, I made $4 billion because I predicted the whole financial crisis. Um, and they're now re-remembering, oh, they kind of knew all along banks weren't well capitalized. So look, my guess is this is not going to be bad as 08, 09, but the way they cavalierly dismiss it, back to Edward Chancellor, you can't just say we had the biggest, broadest asset bubble in 500 years they all have a problem when you go under 2%, and then you lop on 500 basis points in a year and think that there's a 100% chance this is not going to get really bad. And then they go, everybody on TV, well, we're going to have no recession or a soft landing. We've had three soft landings since 1950. Three. And they were all preceded by perfectly timed Fed hikes before you got the inflation taking off. I mean, it's possible. I'm not short right now, probably should be, the way I'm talking, but, but I mean, to make a bet that the equity markets, go, you know, not, and, and the economy are not going to have a problem, if you're a risk-reward guy waiting for a fat pitch, this is like the thinnest thing ever, this is like Sandy Koufax, and he's got, you know, 0 and 2. One, one thing I feel like is worth pointing out to the class you just presented earlier is how you can manage concentrated portfolios with concentrated ideas and still have these elements of humility that you have. Like, you're willing to say, I don't know. Well, I also got a lot of losses I've had over my years. You know, I, I got scars all over my body. Here's one you can actually see. Um, so, you know, we were talking earlier. I, I'm not as good of an investor as I was in my 30s and 40s. I can predict better, but I don't pull the trigger the way I was when I was young. And I only hire people in their 20s. Um, you know, once you get the scars I have, it, it, it wears on you, so the humility is well earned. But yeah, you've got to have humility. If somebody asks me, what do, you, what do you think made you so successful? My first answer would be having an open mind. I never get wedded to a position. I've had positions where I was sure I was going to hold them two years, 
and a week later I not only didn't have the position, I was short because conditions change. If conditions change, you have to move immediately. That was true 20 years ago. It's 10x now with the internet and everything. So you got the, this interview I did in, with a Norway guy, he asked me about analysis and all this. I said, we, we, if I get an instinct, we do a big investment, then we study it, and if, the, and if the study turns out wrong, I get rid of it. But if you wait around, there was a great one this morning. Somebody talked about something, they went from 50 to 63 or wherever. If you wait around in today's world, I'm not that smart. If I figured it out with my instinct, somebody else might figure it out while I'm doing my analysis. I'm not saying I don't do my work. I do, but if I got a strong instinct, I invest, and then I investigate, and then if the investigation turns out, I get out. So can I ask an AI question now? Yeah. So what are your thoughts on uh, generative AI? I think it has the potential to be as transformative and bigger, net th bigger than the internet. And I'm not a fad buyer, you know, quite the contrary, just the opposite. But this, the implications of this thing are just mind-boggling. They're mind-boggling for macro, um, in terms of disinflation, in terms of productivity. It turns out the internet didn't turn out to be very productive because everybody's on their phone you know, for two hours a day not doing work. This, this, stuff, this stuff is just amazing. It could be incredibly disruptive. If I was a young investor, this is going to create change, and change is what creates security price change. So A, I think it's for real. B, I think it's going to be huge. I haven't decided yet whether it's going to be the model builders or on the application level. We kind of think it's going to be application level, but to humility, um, we're not sure. So far, the only thing we really did, got lucky, we bought a lot of NVIDIA last year because the one thing that looked clear is there's like 10 of them are going to try and build all this stuff, and NVIDIA has a monopoly on the chips. No one else makes the chips needed um, to build this stuff. And then uh, we bought a lot of Microsoft because I think he's going to run it through the whole Office 365 product. And obviously, Azure is going gonna, is gonna to create a lot of demand for power through Azure. They both run so much. I haven't sold them, but I don't know. I, I think it's going to be huge, and we're spending a whole lot of time thinking about it and working on it. And luckily, I have younger partners who know what they're talking about. I'm just talking a good game up here. You've described a situation where U.S. exceptionalism is at risk, but you also mentioned you know, the challenges in China with slowing economic growth. If you look across the world, if you're projecting forward 2040, 2050, if the U.S. is not leading, if China is not leading, who is? Is it Europe? Is it South America? Is it Africa, the Middle East? I don't know whether there's going to be a leader. Um, I think it might be multipolar. It's very clear that MBS is trying to create Saudi Arabia as dominant and control that region. It didn't get much press, but he greeted the guy, the prime minister of Egypt at the airport, and he took him to the airport. I thought that was very different. They made a deal with Iran. It looks like he's trying to create a Mideast bloc with, with them, the leader of that bloc. Um, Europe, Europe it, it, it's, it's hard to ever get really bullish on Europe, but I actually like the Euro because they already are the Euro and we're like becoming the Euro and, 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 and currency prices are relative, so I think you could have a change there. I don't, know there, there will, I don't know where there will be a leader. I'm hoping it's the United States. But the reason I started screaming about this stuff was 2011 is because I thought we were on the clock. And this is why I talk today, because we, we had a chance to do a lot the last 10 years. Well, we've done a lot. We've spent another $10 trillion, And the, the party in power wants to spend more. And I'm not sure the Republicans won't either if they get in power. 
you've talked in the past about uh, treasury market being a nice indicator and signal for you over your career and that it's been distorted over the past cycle, which clearly it has. I'm curious if you think that signal is back in the markets with the rate increases and, and what it's telling you today. Yeah, I'm paying a lot. I'm paying a lot of attention to it now that we don't, now that the Fed is not adjusting their balance sheet. Um, I should have mentioned that in my little litany of things. We have the most inverted yield curve in history, and the last 11 times the yield curve inverted less than this, we had a recession. So again, back to the odds. But yeah, the, I'm paying a lot of attention to the Treasury market, and you know, I think it's, I think it's predicting uh, a bad economy. Um, two years ago, remember you called me in Sun Valley, we couldn't figure it out, 10 years gone down 115 basis points, and it was, we were going, what is going on here? Well, the Fed was buying all the treasuries. So I don't want to sit here and, because I agree with it or don't agree with it, I'm trying to be true to myself, and the treasury market's been a good indicator, and it's definitely predicting economic darkness. So with that, what's, um, what's wrong with sticking all your money in short-term bonds yielding 5%? Nothing as long as you're willing, um, if you get a hard landing, to move it into risk assets. That's a good strategy. And if you don't get a risk asset, if you don't get a hard landing, something will come along. But if you don't- I'm to, not gonna do that, I'm just- You don't need to go out f five years, oh, you didn't say five years. No, 5%, you don't, you don't, that's a, that's a good place to park your money. I will say, don't get seduced by it. When I started Duquesne, five years you yielded 15%, and you were supposed to buy equities. I don't think that's the situation today. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the market's 19 and a half times. If I'm right on the economy, it's probably 40 times or something. Um, it's just, I think it's a fine place to park your money. Well, I, I think it's happening. I had a guy call me up three weeks ago. He has money in Zion's bank, and he said, what do you think of Zion's bank? Do you think they're going to go under? I said, no, but if there's a one in a thousand chance of going under, you should move your money to J.P. Morgan. It's just so anybody who's a rational thinker, we're not going to be sit here and be patriotic. Just the, the inconvenience if they go under. I think the problem with the banks I don't think we have to worry about, well, I'm not worried about them going under. I'm worried about how are they ever going to make any money? Um, because they're not going to get the deposits. I'm talking about the regional banks. I don't think the stock prices are, I th I'm more worried about their stock prices than them bringing down the whole system. But can you imagine how bad First Republic was? that this government let J.P. Morgan take it over? I mean, the one thing they did not want, which is why Silicon Valley got so screwed up, is to have the poster child of the banking industry that Elizabeth Warren is gonna have a heart attack over. So that thing had to be really bad. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, very eye-opening and very scary. I'm a, a CIF student. I do the Global Equity Fund. I do scary well. Yes, yeah, well, uh, my question is, a lot of us, I'm sure we see that, and my buddy here, at least Mike, best uh, fixed income guy here in SIF, we agree that this is very scary, and he looked at me and said, hey, Hector, what should we do about it? And I said, that's a good question, Mike. I don't think Mr. Junkenmiller said that. So is there a to-do list of things that us, as newly minted MBAs, starting two weeks from now, actions we could take to help with the situation? It's scary. We don't want it to happen. What can we do to prevent it? Thank you. Um, I would like to see young people use their political voice. That's why I started this. I don't mean to pick on Bernie Sanders, but I'm going to, why are you all so in love with Bernie Sanders? The guy wants to raise Social Security for current seniors. 
By the way, you guys are not young people, you're future seniors. This is, this is what I don't get, this, this line about we can't cut entitlements for seniors. You're screwing seniors, you're just screwing the future seniors. Why do they get a dollar and you get zero? Can we give them like 85 cents and you get 15 cents? But the first thing you can do is get out there. Look, it's political suicide to take on entitlements. But it's political suicide because the old geezers in my generation, we make sure it's political suicide. You guys should be on top of this. The way you've been so prescient on climate change, that's 40 years ahead. This is only 15 years ahead. Use your voice, get out there. This is such a no-brainer policy-wise. We're gonna go down the drink if we don't change this. And it's changeable. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, that leads me to one of my questions. First, a fellow Pittsburgher. Yes, and please. We had a good draft. Yes. <laughs> it's wonderful to see one of us succeed as you have. But I grew up low income in Castle Shannon, and so my first question to you is about the entitlements. My gut tells me that you and Mr. Stone and a few others here don't need to get Social Security. Correct. How do you suggest cutting the entitlements? Because my people still need them is the first question. Second question for all of us though here who love investing, how are you shorting the dollar against the basket of currencies or a particular currency? And the last question is, can you explain to us, we've had three of the four largest bank collapses in the last two months in US history and the VIX is at 16. I think that, I'll start with the last one. I think the VIX is at 16 because since the bank collapse, the Fed has done $400 billion in put on their balance sheet. I, I literally think it's that simple and that stupid. Um, so $400 billion of liquidity has come in. I'm actually dumb enough to think the market is higher now than it would have been uh, if Silicon Valley hadn't happened. It's got a lot of danger signals, though. I think I read today that, or this weekend, seven stocks. Uh, are 85 percent of the gain in the S&P this year. I'm almost old enough to remember, but I have to say I'm old enough to have studied this whole nifty 50 thing. It feels like that. In terms of Social Security, the first thing we should do is means test it. I'm sorry for the people who need it. They can have it, but we can at least get rid of the colas. They got a 9.6% increase last year. Do you know any working man that got a 9.6% increase last year? So again, I'm sorry, you know, I'm a horrible person for saying it, but they should get 90% of the loaf instead of 100% and just deal with it and adjust their lifestyle because future seniors, the way it's set up, they're not, they're not gonna get 90 cents, they're gonna get like, 50 cents of health care and zero of Social Security. We've got to start somewhere. Where I would start right now is means testing, so Sheldon and I don't get it. I don't even know where I get it. Do you know whether you get it? I'm, I know I'm eligible. I hope I'm not taking it. I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> but, but means test it by all means, but I would, first step would be eliminate the COLA increases. Do you know what these new grads would do for five grand a month? Yeah, when I used to run around, I used to do it with Jeff Canada and, and with, so I could show the left that this wasn't some right-wing <laughs> conspiracy. And Ken Langone, and Langone used to announce in public he gets 4,800 a month, <clears throat> and people were just gasping. It's just, and he would use the analogy, it's pretty good. If you buy fire insurance and there's no fire, you don't get your money back. Um, these people say, I put the money in, well, it's insurance. That's what the whole Social Security thing started as, but then it became an entitlement. So I feel for those people. I think it's terrible. But if this happens, believe me, they're going to be more screwed than any of us. And how are you shorting the dollar? Well, currently I have gold, which I consider a currency. I have the euro. I've been in the Mexican peso and the Brazil. This was the weirdest moment ever. 
like a year and a half ago, my Argentina partner is sitting in his office and he's, he's on a Zoom call. And there's like 20 central bank heads there, and they're all Latin Americans. And they're all complaining about how crazy the Fed policy is with zero rates. I mean, with the world I grew up in, this is like crazy. Uh, the, the Latin American central banks are now much more responsible than the United States central bank. Well, at least until a year ago. Uh, what else do I have? I've got some others, but uh, the, Euro, the Euro is, oh, I have Australia which could be a big mistake, but that's kind of on the reopening in China and if Powell pivots when we get a hard landing. But the euro and gold and, and the two Latin American currencies are my big one right now. I'll take one last question, or maybe two. So, sorry, Chris, one second. What is your outlook for inflation? Do you think that the Fed has either the willingness or ability to tackle it given how quickly they I don't know if you were here two years ago, I had a lot of conviction. I don't have, this is, this is really complicated and I don't, I've never seen this movie. If you put a gun to my head and said I was gonna die if I'm not wrong, but I don't need to do that so I'm not playing, I would say it's gonna come down to two and a half or three percent over the next year, year and a half. Powell's gonna panic because it's coming down because of hard landing and, and then it'll go back up to five or six because he won't have squashed it. He let the genie out of the bottle. But I literally don't know. I, I could literally see in a crazy hard landing deflation after an asset bubble, or I could see 8% inflation. Very useful answer. I'm sorry, but it's, a, <laughs> and it's all I got. A quick follow on, since you mentioned the, the Australia and the China reopening, just your, your view on commodities broadly, especially if you know some of the inflation they're not able to I'm, I'm long oil. I've lost my butt in the last four weeks. I haven't taken it off because I think the Saudis really need it above 70, 75. And if the reopening thing works, it could go to 100. We're, gonna, we're now in a state of drawing balances for the next seven months. But by the way, everybody knows that, and it keeps going down, and I keep losing money. But this is one of those cases. I don't use stop losses, but if the fundamentals change, I'll get out. But the fundamentals still tell me I'm supposed to be long, and I'm long gold. And copper, copper's complicated. Copper's the wildest bullish supply-demand situation I've ever seen. But if you get a hard landing, I'm not sure I want to own it. But I definitely want to own it long term because it's, the inventories are crazy and this whole EV thing is going to happen. Sorry. Thank you very much for being here. Um, to what extent, if any, do things like fusion or generative AI, the produ productivity increases, help mitigate some of the risks that you've outlined? Tonight. Could be huge. Could be. Got to be monitored. Got to be really open-minded. I'm really wrestling with the AI thing. I'm guessing the AI rollout because you got to spend so much money first and then you got like my daughter works at Palantir. They can't use it because of uh, security. I'm guessing the big AI, if there is a big defla disinflationary, I'm guessing it's two years away, but I don't even know because some of this stuff is so active now. Somebody called me yesterday and said 99.6% GPT-4 can do your taxes. Maybe not you and mine, Sheldon, but like. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. So I thought we could end with a question maybe about money since there. Haven't we been talking about money? Well, a different type. Um, <laughs> They're, many of them are graduating, probably will go make salaries they haven't seen before. Some are probably still looking for jobs. And I thought, with you here, you're a multi-billionaire. Can you talk about what wealth has done to you and how you think about it, if you think you're happier having immense wealth, and how you think graduates should think about money? Well, my grandmother said I'd rather be rich than poor, and we didn't have any money, but uh, that, that's a joke. Look. Um, I'm a really happy person. I don't, it's not because of the amount of money I have, but part of having earned success um, has given me that happiness. And you worry about, if you have money, about screwing up your children with, with inheriting too much money because they won't enjoy earned success. And it's, it's harder to raise children with money I came no credit for it. I don't know how she did it, but I've got, talk about my wife, I've got 
three overachievers who are very happy and they're working hard. Um, it enables me to do philanthropy stuff I'd never be able to do. And I don't like give back or feel an obligation to do philanthropy. I love giving money away because it gives me joy. Uh, to support a Jeff Canada and watch it happen or to watch the changes that have happened because of EDF and the environment, it gives me joy. I'm not like giving back or feeling guilty or anything. Like I feel it's a privilege and I think anybody with my amount of money would do it and those who don't, I don't think, oh, what a bad person. I think they're really missing the boat. What are they going to do, roll around their coffin with it? <laughs> but no, I, look, the thing that makes me the happiness and this is what I would really tell the young graduates, is I love my job. I'm addicted to it. So you've got to find your passion in life. And it may not be finance. Just because you're a business graduate doesn't mean you should, this is the thing you're going to love in life. Uh, I started as an English major. And particularly in this business, if you don't love it, you're going to lose. Because every time you buy something, somebody else is selling it. You better know what you're doing, and if, and if you got workaholics in this industry, and you will, because some people, it just, they get the bug. So don't think money's going to make you happy. I think doing something that you're passionate about, but yeah, I'd rather have it than not have it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, it's an honor for us to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you Thank you. This ends the keynote recording. Thank you.